I'm Ian Burkeeble. I'm the Project Manager for Great Plains Grazing, and I am going to introduce you Justin Wagner, who is a Beef Systems Specialist at Kansas State University, and he is going to talk about winter nutrition and supplementation. With that, I'm going to let Justin be in charge. All right. Uh, still coming through okay, Amber? Yep, beautiful. All right. Well, um, I want to thank uh, Amber and the rest of the team for this opportunity to uh, talk about winter nutrition and supplementation today. Uh, the approach I'm going to take with this topic is uh, really try to, to be somewhat general, but yet cover a lot of ground and, and really kind of talk about some different tools that might be out there in terms of helping producers with their supplementation programs over the, uh, the winter. Um, and with that, you know, there's we, there's lots of different approaches to this, especially as we start to talk about energy and protein. And there really isn't what I would call a one-size-fits-all approach to supplementation, even though a lot of times uh, that's the approach we tend to take from a production standpoint. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is is really kind of, understand what are some of the drivers uh, in building a winter nutrition and a supplementation program. Um, the first one of those is cow nu nutrition requirements. Um, and that can be a little bit different depending on whether you're a spring calving herd or a fall calving herd. If you're in a spring uh, calving herd, this time of year, especially right now, uh, you're coming into the third trimester most likely uh, and be approaching calving um, here in, in probably the next 45 to 60 days potentially. And so this is a, a time of um, increased where nutrient requirements increase rather dramatically as we move into this time period. And especially as we move into calving, um, they increase dramatically once we um, get into lactation. On the fall calving side, we've already got most of those calves on the ground. However, this can be a challenging time from the standpoint of you have a calf at side. And for most producers, this is going to coincide with the breeding season as we move in the months of usually um, December and, and January. Uh, the other factor that's in here is, is cow body condition. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, body condition scoring, uh, you know, if we've got cows that are a little bit behind where we'd like them to be, um, that can certainly be a factor. Another kind of a big rock uh, as we look at the winter nutrition programs would be where we are operating most likely on some sort of dormant forage base. And so we have some you know, two big factors there would be the quantity of forage that's available for the animal to consume. And then we've also got this issue of forage quality. Um, in terms of native uh, range, uh, typically our forage quality begins to decline uh, sometime late summer. And we'll, as we go through the winter, we can, it can actually continue to decline a little bit just due to weathering. Um, as we proceed through the, the late winter months. So those are some of the, the issues that are, that are out there. Um, what I thought I'd do today is really kind of start by addressing cow energy requirements. Uh, if you'll notice here, I used a 1,400 pound cow with 20 pounds of peak lactation potential or peak milk. And this may be a little bit different. Uh, a lot of producers, when we ask them what the most, or what the weight of their cow is on average, their most common answer is 1,200 pounds. Um, you take several different sources. I think today, uh, probably our average cow in the U.S. might be more appropriately represented by a 1,400 pound cow. Now, we'll say there are some smaller cows out there. It's just on average, cattle have gotten a little bit bigger, so it's uh, it's it's certainly something to be aware of. And so I I try to utilize a 1,400 pound cow for representation purposes when I can. Uh, so you can see as our energy requirements uh, in this graph, essentially uh, there are 13 months represented. So on either end of the spectrum, we have weaning. So it essentially goes from weaning to weaning. Calving would be represented by this point here with peak lactation being somewhere up here where our nutrient demands are going to be the highest. Uh, so now if we take a look at that, and say we have a, a dormant forage base here that's going to be represented by having um, an energy content around 0.35 megacals per pound. Uh, the forage intake will vary based on forage quality. 
Um, so it can range from anywhere on the low end of one and a half percent of body weight. Uh, if cows are consuming that, it's going to supply about 7.3 mega cows. Uh, forage consumption could be higher if forage quality is a, is a little bit better. Uh, and that would supply about 9.8 mega cows or, or 10 mega cows on the graph here. So you can kind of easily see on this dormant forage base that we're operating on this time of year, um, we've certainly got some deficiencies in terms of the distance between what the forage will supply on an energy standpoint and where our cow requirements at. Now, you know, depending on when you calve, you could mentally kind of shift this graph one direction or this curve one way or the other uh, to give you a better idea of where you're at. But, you know, as we look at, you know, weaning a dormant, in a, in a dry cow, especially as we go through maybe the, the second trimester especially, it's, it's actually pretty adequate in terms of energy requirements. It's really when we begin to move into these additional demands of the third trimester as we get closer to calving, so represent 60 days prior to calving would be represented by this standpoint. And certainly on as we get into lactation that we've got quite a, a deficiency here to make up in terms of our supplementation program. Um, Energy is, is very commonly deficient in um, winter nutrition programs. However, a lot of times we, we focus on the protein side of the equation, um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through the presentation. So the other side is, is protein requirements. Uh, this is essentially the same graph. You could really, the shape of the curves between the energy and protein requirements are, are very, very similar. Um, if we look at a, a dormant uh, forage base um, that's going to supply about 5% crude protein forage, and let's say this is a situation where we are supplementing protein so we get a little bit higher intake on these cows, we'd be at around 2.2% of body weight, which would supply about a pound and a half of, sup of, of protein to the cow. Um, so you can certainly see there, there is a bit of a, of a gap here represented by our nutrient requirement line in the blue and what our forage supply would provide. Um, now obviously, uh, as we get closer to the springtime when we get to green forage, uh, we can say, well, what does that look like in terms of early spring uh, green up? This can vary quite a bit depending on where you're at in the country and the forage base that you're operating on. I used 11% um, crude protein here at that same level of intake. Uh, which would supply about 3.4 pounds of uh, protein to the cow. Um, so, you know, depending on where we're at calving peak lactation, we could actually be meeting our protein requirements um, as long as we're close to spring green up and there's an adequate supply of the forage. Um, now, obviously, um, forage doesn't just go from 11 to 5% crude protein as we move through the later months of the summer. Um, uh, so I kind of put a transition point here of about 7. Uh, I chose a 7% crude protein level uh, essentially because that's what we traditionally think of being the cutoff point where we would want to begin initiating crude protein supplementation. That kind of makes sense, especially if you look at where that 7% line would or that bar would overlap with our cow requirements. Um, and like I said, if you are... Uh, you know, a fall calving producer and you just mentally shift that line to where it would kind of fit in relationship to green forage on your operation. Um, so we do have um, quite a bit of distance here if, especially on a spring calving herd as we get into this second trimester stage, into the third trimester up to peak lactation where if we're operating on a 5% crude protein forage base, then we would certainly need some additional uh, protein. So a lot of our efforts when we talk about protein supplementation tend to be, or on just winter supplementation in general, tend to focus on protein supplementation. Um, and here's the reason why. Uh, this is a graph that shows increasing amounts of soybean meal intake as a, as a protein supplement and cow performance. Uh, these are cows, this is some K-State work that was uh, fed basically a low Low, quality, low to moderate quality forage. Um, you can see here the blue line represents predicted average daily gain, and the green line represents the actual performance of the cows on this particular study. Uh, so the question is, well, why do we see a greater amount of cow performance or improved cow performance as that soybean meal um, uh, intake goes up around to that three pounds per head per day amount? 
Well, part of that is when we supplement protein, what tends to happen is we also meet the rumen microbial needs uh, for nitrogen. When we do that, that enhances uh, low quality forage or low to moderate quality forage intake, uh, which increases the overall energy status and results in an improvement in, in cow performance. So if we meet the protein requirements of the cow, that improves our overall energy status. And that's why our typical production discussions are about protein supplementation. However, we can't forget about the, the energy side of the equation. So this graph, I've, I've come back to, to my energy requirements and looked at it with protein supplementation on a dormant forage. So essentially that situation where we're getting maximum intake of our low quality uh, forage base. And when we do that, uh, it does improve our, our overall energy status by doing that, but you can easily see if we are calving on a dormant forage base or we're uh, further along in lactation, we're still operating on this, we've still obviously got some deficiencies in, in terms of energy. So there's a, a number of different situations that might occur where, where although we um, are meeting the protein requirements of the cow, uh, that we might still potentially be deficient in energy. And so what does this show up? Uh, this essentially shows up in terms of uh, uh, cow condition uh, will get mobilized to, to make up uh, for the deficiency in, in energy if we're in some of these situations. So kind of my take home point with this is um, energy and protein are, are really two um, components of a winter nutrition program that are, that are really intimately linked. We tend to focus a lot of our efforts on the protein side, which I think is appropriate, but at the same time, we also have to recognize that we could potentially be deficient in energy, depending on a situation where we calve um, and what we have in terms of both forage quality and, and forage availability. Um, and so there's we certainly have situations where protein is deficient, where energy might be deficient, and there's other situations where we could be deficient in both energy and protein. And so I think, you know, um, that's, that's a little bit difficult for us to sort out um, in terms of producers of what might be the most appropriate supplement to, uh, to put out in front of cows at, at a certain um, time of year with, with each, um, for a given situation. Um, so this is just what the situation looks like as we go to green forage. You can easily see here once again that you know we're, we're in excess of uh, most of our energy requirements once we get to that point. Um, so we've kind of got this issue of the energy and protein and, and what type of supplement um, we might need. We've also got a lot more options in terms of supplemental feedstuffs uh, than what we used to have historically in the uh, in the industry, um, you know, several years ago, if we we uh, go back, you know, predominant supplement in Kansas was probably alfalfa hay, uh, some range cubes, maybe a, a blend of soybean meal and some sort of energy source, be that milo or corn. And if you look at what we have available to us today, we've got commercially available tubs. We've also got byproducts which have come on the scene, which which do fit very well as a, into a cow supplementation program. Uh, then we've got different types of supplements, be it liquids, tubs, all kinds of different forms uh, that could be out there. So one of the resources that, that I use a lot, because really what a lot of this grant to, for me is about, is helping producers really increase the flexibility of their operation in the face of different um, production scenarios or climate change or variations where drought may be more prevalent or may be limited by forage availability. So a resource that I, I stumbled across uh, several years ago was a beef cow supplement decision tree. Uh, this was put together by Mathis and Sawyer in 2007. Uh, it's in a review article uh, in the Veterinary Clinics of North America. And what I like about um, this particular decision tree is it really boils down this issue of uh, supplementation really to two to three very basic questions and the first one of those really gets at the forage availability uh, which we talked about in the first slide and it's you know a very simple question is does a cow have all she can eat uh, in the pasture each and every day and you know if the answer to that is yes 
um, our forage supply is adequate? If the answer to that is no, obviously a forage supply is inadequate. And in that situation, most likely energy is going to be deficient because we don't have um, an ample amount of forage to, to meet her needs. Really the second layer of this decision tool is then, you know, what color is the forage? And what that issue really gets at is, is forage quality. Um, typically brown forages are going to be uh, less than 7% crude protein. Um, and as I said before, that's kind of our cutoff where we need to really begin to start thinking about maybe protein supplementation. Uh, however, green forage is most likely going to be greater than 7% crude protein. So we kind of follow down the left side of this decision tree and we say, okay, our forage supply is adequate. Uh, and I would call this maybe the, the typical uh, winter nutrition scenario. Uh, we're operating on a brown forage base. So we know protein is likely um, less than 7%. Uh, it's probably limiting our forage intake and digestion. So in that case, we're, we're looking predominantly in a protein supplement. Uh, really the next layer is, well, what kind of body condition are the cows in? Uh, we've got cows that are in good body condition. Um, the supplement that we're gonna be looking for is, is gonna be a high protein supplement. We're gonna, our goal here is to improve rumen um, efficiency. Um, so, so it really breaks it down into two nice questions. So the other side of that is, okay, let's walk down the side of the graph where we say forage supply is inadequate and we're on brown forage. And so this is a situation where we're most likely limiting in both energy and protein. Um, because our protein is, is less than 7%, we don't have a, an adequate forage supply for the cow to graze. And, and so this is really where we have that situation of both energy and protein being deficient. Uh, we need to look at supplements that are going to bring both some protein and some energy to the equation. Um, like I said, I found this to be a, a very helpful decision tool that's out there for producers because I think it is confusing. And I, and I really like the fact that it breaks it down into two uh, very simple simple questions um, that we can answer that address some of those big issues as it comes to, to building the supplementation program in terms of what we should be looking for. So with that tool, it, it kind of helps us determine, well, are we looking for a protein supplement? Are we looking for an energy-based supplement? Are we looking for really a combination supplement? And so the, the next step in kind of this building a supplementation uh, program is to determine what supplements we have available. Now a lot of times this can be local resources in terms of a local co-op. Um, however, if you want to get a, a sense of what might be available and where prices rank, there's several uh, good tools that are out there. Uh, one of these that I use a lot is the University of Missouri Byproduct Feed Price List. Um, I'll show you a screenshot of that in here in a minute. The University of Nebraska also has one that's, that's out there. And it'll show you just a variety of commodity products that are out there and what the prices are at a particular location. So for Kansas, I've got um, some ethanol plants. You can pull them up on there and see what their byproducts are currently being listed for FOB the plant. Uh, if we're looking at forage prices, uh, we also have the Kansas Haymarket News. Um, but, you know, a lot of times with that, what I recommend a producer do is, is, you know, we've got several different ag publications that will have classifieds in them. Uh, it doesn't take long to flip to that section, pull it up, find a, you know, a similar forage that's out there that somebody's advertising. Uh, really does as, as good a job as I can think of. of. You know, says, well, here's what someone is willing to sell this hay for. That's probably what it's worth in the marketplace. So, so I'll use a variety of those sources to kind of set the prices and, and maybe get a better idea of, of certainly what's available and what's out there. Um, this is a screenshot of the University of Missouri tool. You can see uh, different locations from Lincoln, Nebraska, all the way to St. Louis, Missouri in this one uh, with a variety of different um, uh, byproducts that might be out there. Really all you have to do is, is kind of scroll through it. If you're in Kansas, there's a, uh, a location here in Arc City, Kansas. Uh, that when I took this was basically showing wheat mids at 255 per ton. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of how you can use that tool maybe to, to set those, those prices. So, okay, we, so we've determined what type of supplement we need. Um, 
you know, what might be available to us. And then so really for me, the next uh, part of this equation is determining what might be the most cost effective supplement. And, and this is probably one of the exercises that I think uh, nutritionists probably do more than producers. Uh, producers tend to go back to supplement programs tend to be dictated a lot of times by what they did the previous year and what they felt like worked well. Um, taking a much broader approach, especially given the fact that we may at certain times of the year be looking for an energy supplement or under different uh, climate conditions such as drought looking for an energy supplement um, relative to a protein supplement, for example. Um, it's, it's really an important way to just take a step back and, and really look at the nutrient composition of some of the different uh, feedstuffs that might be available. Um, and really, the, the key items that you need to, to make an evaluation on a supplementation program, I've highlighted in green uh, here in my slides, and, and that's essentially just the dry matter, a crude protein, and some form of energy, be it TDN or a net energy and maintenance number, typically expressed in omega cows per pound. Um, I've highlighted corn in this typically because um, you know, corn tends to be in the driver's seat in a lot of our markets, so always kind of uh, when I run these numbers as we as we kind of, um, it's always good to kind of have it as a benchmark. Corn uh, here in recent history has really been kind of setting the, the price of a lot of the other products, uh, but you can see there's a wide range. So really what we need is to have some sort of an estimate of the nutrient composition of different forages. Um, and we certainly need the dry matter number, even as you'll see a liquid supplement. One of the things I would caution you is as we go through these next set of tables, um, uh, I have not updated the numbers, and, that, and that's somewhat on purpose. Um, predominantly because I want you to see the value of the exercise, not necessarily getting caught up in, in what the particular value of a particular commodity is. So, so the, really the next step in this is then to, to do a cost per unit calculation. And this can be a, an example is going to be for protein. We can also do it for energy. Uh, because a lot of times we need to evaluate supplements on both an energy and a protein basis. Uh, the math isn't hard. Um, so we take a supplement that's 90% dry matter, it's 20% crude protein, and it's priced at $233 a ton in my example. Uh, so we have a ton of supplement, 2,000 pounds, 90% dry matter means you have 1,800 pounds of dry matter. Um, that 1,800 pounds times the crude protein level gets us to 360 pounds of crude protein in that ton. So we divide our $233 price by the 360 pounds of crude protein. We get a cost per unit of crude protein of 64 cents. And so we can do that for both protein and energy. Um, here's an example of a table. It just looks at cost per unit of energy. Um, as I said earlier, I always kind of include corn in these types of analyses when I sit down with a producer, simply because um, it, it tends to be kind of the currency by which all of the feedstuffs are, are based now. Um, so it's a really good idea, especially if we are shopping for an energy type supplement to, to see what the price of corn is. Um, typically, if we are deficient on a, on a dormant forage base, our traditional recommendation would be to use some sort of a high fiber uh, type supplement so that we don't reduce forage intake. Um, but keep in mind, if that uh, supply of, of energy is, is pretty short, sometimes adding a, um, a pound of corn can be the cheapest way to, to get a little bit of additional energy into a cow. Um, there are levels, if we stay below around that threshold of about a pound or so, actually 2.2 pounds, uh, we don't give up that uh, um, forage intake uh, per se as if we were to feed greater amounts of that starch base. Um, you can see the wet distillers products, dried distillers grains, they tend to work very well in this situation because they are more fiber based. So we do the same thing, cost per unit of energy or cost per unit of protein is what we did for energy. And really all we're doing with these is ranking the particular fee steps in terms of what might be the cheapest. Uh, regardless of whether we're building a supplementation program or we're just simply building a, a growing ration, for example, a lot of times we walk through these same equations um, just to figure out what might be the cheapest uh, source of protein uh, to use in the ration uh, to kind of give us a, a benchmark. And this is, this is really where, where I always start is 
you know, we have to first figure out what we need in terms of energy or protein or a combination. Um, what feedstuffs do we have available that might work as a supplement? And then what prices accordingly is, is kind of our third step. And so this is how we kind of walk through that exercise. Well, we do have some, some other factors um, that are certainly out there as we look at these, these different types of supplements that, that might be available. Um, and I would kind of call these uh, some of the uh, logistical or, or other issues. Um, one of the important things you've, you've got to remember about a supplementation program, it's really based on the assumption that animals will consume the supplement at the targeted amount. So if we have a 20% crude protein supplement and our goal is to deliver two pounds per head per day or four pounds per head per day, that's kind of an assumption we make. Now, in some cases, uh, animals may not consume those, those targeted amounts. Really, it, it varies as a function of forage quality. Um, as forage quality improves or we get closer to spring green up, a lot of times we have trouble with um, uh, supplement consumption. Uh, the other thing can be a major factor is supplement form or type, um, delivery method, um, whether we're on a hand fed or a self -feed, uh, feeder type situation. Um, as most cattle are aware, we've also got some social behaviors. Uh, the old boss cows that push everybody else away if we don't have um, adequate space or we haven't spread our supplement out. So we've got a, a lot of factors that certainly play into to this assumption that all the, the animals are consuming the targeted amount. Uh, so along these lines, one of the, the factors that you have to be aware of is that regardless of the supplementation program, there's going to be a portion of the cows or the animals that may not consume um, the supplement. And these numbers came out of a review paper um, it was out of Montana State in the late 90s. Uh, the classified looked at several different studies, um, essentially broke supplements down into different categories. If we look at um, just hand feeding versus self feeding supplements, um, we had about 5% non eaters in a hand fed supplement. When we went to a self fed supplement, where basically animals are coming at their leisure, um, consuming a supplement, and then have basically uh, ample time to do so, or um, more trough space. Um, we had about 19% of the animals that, that did not consume any supplement. Uh, they also broke their, their data out by different supplement types. Uh, if we were on a block, um, now these are could be the, the hard blocks, it could also be the soft pores. Um, went around 14% of animals that, that didn't consume uh, those type of supplements. So you got into dry supplements, it's 15, so really similar portion of animals that didn't consume supplements between blocks and dry supplements. Um, liquid supplements uh, really had the highest percentage of, uh, of non-eaters in this study. And you know you could you could look at these and say, well, you know, that's a, a different type of supplement than than what these animals may have been exposed to. You know, was it was it new to them? Do they have time to adapt to it? Um, really, this was just a large number of studies, but I think the take-home message is, is that, you know, there is always going to be a portion of animals that may not consume the supplement, and so, um, you know, we may see some variation in consumption patterns or, or intakes or cow condition just based on cows that, that may not consume this. Now, if we're evaluating these different supplement types, you know, a hand, if we want to have a supplement, um, that we're delivering uh, in a very precise manner, um, typically going to a dry supplement that's going to be hand fed is, is probably the best situation. So we need to be aware of these supplement choices that even though we have price, we may also have some other animal factors that, that may uh, indeed uh, impact consumption. Another big factor is more and more, um, you know, we're forced to buy some of these products uh, not necessarily from a local feed mill, but more as a, as a commodity feed stuff, especially the byproducts. And those are going to come in typically in uh, what I'm going to say 25 to, to maybe greater uh, ton truckloads. So having some sort of on-farm storage is, has really become a part of the supplement discussion. Um, you know, certain supplements like dried distillers grains, um, do have some issues with bridging if we put up an overhead bins. Uh, my experience with that has been, you know, uh, even uh, a commercial range cube will, will bridge if it's put into an overhead bin that's hot, that's not vented uh, in a human environment. 
Uh, so as long as we, you know, keep the supplement flowing, we're pouring it, coming out of that bin, uh, using it on a daily basis, we can alleviate some of those. More and more, uh, I think we're seeing a lot more of these structures, uh, what I would call the three-sided commodity base being put in, um, simply because they're, they're extremely versatile, um, uh, relatively cost-effective from what I understand to construct. Um, and has a lot of different commodities. This one here has some distiller's grain uh, put in it. Uh, we've also got, you know, in dump trucks now that, that need adequate height on the structure to offload into. So um, this um, storage and on-farm storage is certainly part of our, our supplement discussions today, just simply uh, in the amounts we have to take some of these feedstuffs in. So one of the things that you should be aware of if you have some existing bins that you may want to use or if a producer has them, um, and different feedstuffs have different bulk densities. Um, most bins are built on an average of about 50 to 55 pounds per cubic foot. I would fall in, um, so ground corn would have a bulk density of 40 pounds. Uh, if you go down to dried distiller's grains, that's 18 to 20. Um, so in some instances, whatever the bin capacity is, if we're going to, to a feedstuff that we haven't put in there before, uh, having uh, a spot or a desired location where we might put some overrun if we get a large truck uh, might certainly be in order, especially if we, if we have a bin that's built on a 50 pounds per cubic foot and we go to something like dry distiller's grains that's only 18 or 20 pounds uh, per foot. So we've also got kind of along these other non-feed type uh, issues that we have to discuss in a uh, in a supplementation program, it's also this concept of operational costs. Um, we used to talk about, uh, I think a lot in extension, is feed costs representing uh, 60 to 70 percent of our, our total expenditures on a beef cow-calf operation. Uh, this graph shows numbers from the Kansas Farm Management Association uh, that tracks both feed costs and, and what I would call operational or non-feed costs on beef cow operations. If we go back to 2010 and the most recent numbers we have are, are in 2014, um, the red bars here are operational costs and our, and our feed costs are in blue. Um, and so more and more if we look at both of these costs are increasing, but our operational costs are, are also going up as well. And, and really if you look at them, they're essentially about a 50-50 split. So not only do we have to pay attention to you know, making an economical decision on our supplement and feed choices, but also um, our operational costs in terms of storage, delivery, uh, feeding the cows on a daily basis. And so it uh, certainly brings another layer uh, to the supplementation program. Uh, for me, the, the, you know, the key operational considerations that I think we have to evaluate, especially as we begin to look at maybe a new supplement or a, a byproduct, if you will, that we haven't fed before, is you know, what equipment do we have on the operation? Uh, especially here in Southwest Kansas where I'm at, you know, most of our cow-calf operations might have a cake box and a bale bed. Um, they, they certainly, you know, may not have a, a feed truck if they want to handle a wet product. Um, they may be in a, in a location where simply getting large equipment back into it uh, isn't feasible. Other operations may have um, a tractor, a, a mixer box, et cetera. So there's a lot of different uh, resources that each individual operation might have and might be able to use their advantage that might make them uh, be able to use one supplement type over another. Um, you know, right now fuel prices have, have certainly come down, uh, but if we look at just in, in general, they, they are an expense. Uh, especially on larger operations, you know, how efficient is our, our delivery route? If, especially if we've got cows that are, that we're delivering a supplemental uh, feed stuff to, and, and they're a long ways from the home base of operation. Uh, is there a way we can schedule our cow moves so that they get closer to home um, as, as we increase our, our supplementation program or we initiate that? A um, couple other issues are, well, how often do we need to feed the supplement? Um, another limitation that in some instances uh, can make a decision for us in terms of what product we use is, you know, how much do we have to haul um, if we're looking at a byproduct or, uh, you know, how much of that product are we going to have to put in the, the back of this cake box and, and at what point do we, um, 
go from a cake box to maybe more of a, of a mixer truck or, or something like that. And so those are some of the operational considerations. Uh, some good rules of thumb, I would say, in terms of supplement delivery. If we're delivering an energy supplement, and so this is that situation where we most likely don't have an adequate forage supply, um, really that supplement for, for optimum performance should be fed daily or every other day. Uh, if we're delivering a protein supplement uh, that's less than 30% crude protein, uh, probably best to feed that supplement daily. Um, the combination protein and energy supplements that I talked about earlier in the presentation would, would probably fit into this uh, category, kind of uh, being both an energy and a protein supplement. So we're looking at daily or every other day. Um, if we're uh, simply supplying crude protein to the cow herd, uh, utilizing a high protein uh, supplement, uh, there's a, quite a number of research studies that are out there um, that would indicate that we can deliver that supplement as infrequently as, as one time per week or once every six days without adversely affecting cow performance. Uh, for me, um, I think that's probably a, a it's nice to know that, that we can do that, um, but that's only maybe seeing a particular set of cows once per week. A lot of times, especially during the winter months, we're, we're going to check water. Uh, so what, what we've kind of uh, is typically done is, is really uh, every other day or maybe every third day. Um, but if the cows are, you know, quite a ways from home, we could certainly deliver that supplement to those cows um, one time per week and, and not necessarily impact cow performance. Um, the other factor, especially as we go through the, the winter months, is this issue of cold stress and, and how that impacts cows. Um, what's shown here in, in this table is the lower critical temperatures for beef cattle uh, at different uh, temperatures uh, and different coat conditions. And, and what always surprises me every time I look at this uh, data is if we have uh, cows that uh, are either wet or have, uh, have not had a chance to, to grow out their winter hair coat, uh, they're still in a summer coat. So, you know, uh, two situations that come to mind is that, that just really early cold snap that comes in in October uh, where cows haven't had time to adjust. Or if we get into situations where we've got freezing rain, cows have been, been wet for several hours overnight, those cows can really begin experiencing cold stress at uh, temperatures uh, around 59 degrees. And, you know, 59 degrees on a, on a winter day actually probably seems like a pretty nice balmy temperature. However, if you would, you know, put that into your perspective of being both wet and having a, and a wind behind it, you can certainly appreciate where that cow would, would be at. Um, as we increase the cow's um, winter hair coat from a fall coat to a winter coat all the way to a heavy winter coat, uh, the lower critical temperature goes down. Um, you know, a dry winter hair coat, cold stress starts in at about 32 degrees. Um, and I'd say that that's, tends to be our threshold is, is um, that, that freezing benchmark when cows begin to experience cold stress. Now, once again, you know, we need to take in not necessarily just the actual air temperature, uh, but really that ambient or real field temperature. Uh, now, the interesting thing about cold stress is it, it only increases maintenance energy requirements. It doesn't impact protein, vitamins, or, or mineral requirements. It's just simply additional energy expenditure. So the general rule of thumb is that cold stress increases maintenance energy by 1% um, uh, for each degree, we're below the lower critical temperature. So if a cow has a dry winter hair coat, uh, lower critical temperature there's 32 degrees, and our temperature um, is, is right around that 20 degree mark, uh, we've got around a 12% increase in maintenance energy requirements for that cow. Um, so we certainly may want to look at a situation where if we are maybe in that later stages of gestation, cow nutrient requirements are going up and we combine that with cold stress, we've certainly got a situation where, where energy may be limiting. Uh, the other thing that uh, can happen, especially as we get uh, winter weather events that move through, is 
when we get experience of snowfall, cold temperatures, et cetera, grazing behavior um, often changes. Cattle, uh, it's pretty common for them just to kind of to, to huddle up in groups and, and kind of weather the storm so they're not out there grazing, which really kind of further compounds the issue. I think uh, a lot of times a typical production response is, well, we'll just throw a little bit more of the supplement that we're using out to those cows. Um, in reality, if that's a protein supplement, um, it probably does bring a little bit more energy into the equation, but it probably doesn't meet the cow's uh, energy requirements at that standpoint. Uh, a lot of times if we happen to have um, a forage, uh, say some, some harvested forage or some hay that is uh, a slightly higher quality than the, the grazed forage that those cows would be on, it's a good opportunity to, to maybe utilize that in combination with our uh, protein or our other supplement that we may be using. But, um, you know, keep in mind, it is just a factor that's going to increase maintenance energy requirements, not necessarily protein. Um, so, so there is a difference there where just simply throwing more protein at the, at the cow may not correct the deficiency. Um, so that was my discussion this afternoon on winter nutrition and supplementation programs. Uh, we've got a few people. I'd certainly uh, be happy to entertain any questions. If you want to use the chat box for that, I believe is the, the, the standard protocol, and uh, I'll do my best to address them.